So Cliff Broughton, W4FT, and I were up in Baltimore at the uh, Digital Communications Conference for Tapper, and we went out to lunch, and we passed by this building that had all of these uh, radar antennas. And then we noticed it also had some ham radio antennas. So we decided to check it out. Turns out it was the National Electronics Museum. Now, we had never heard of it, so on Monday, after the conference was over, and before we headed back to North Carolina, we decided to stop by and see what it was all about. We figured from all the antennas that ham radio would play some part in this museum. Turns out it was a pretty big part. Welcome to the National Electronics Museum. I'm Les Jamison. My call sign is WR3X. Our tour began with the good old Jacob's Ladder. Then Cliff got a lesson in how electricity is generated. And we moved on to radio, which is a big part of what the museum has to offer. We heard a few words from Marconi. On the December the 12th, 1901, that I placed the single earphone to my ear and started listening. The chief question was whether wireless waves would be stopped by the curvature of the Earth. The first and final answer to that question came at 12.30 when I heard We ordered a pizza over the telegraph. You should be sending American Morse. I don't know American Morse. I'm going to send international. That would be a large pepperoni and cheese, please. Well, the pizza never came, which may say something about my sending ability. So we looked at some old military equipment. I was particularly intrigued by this cutaway view of a mobile installation. I'm a big fan of operating mobile, and I'm glad things have gotten a little bit smaller. I'm pretty sure this truck doesn't get very good gas mileage. I was also impressed by this really nice exhibit of an early ham radio spark station. I've seen spark equipment before, but I've never seen it assembled in what I'll assume is a really authentic looking station. That's amazing. A receiver, a transmitter with no tubes, no dials, no readouts, no displays. I only wish it could actually operate so I could see it and even more importantly hear it to see what ham radio sounded like in those days. I know spark was a really broad signal and there wasn't really any tuning. I mean everybody was kind of mixed together on the same wavelength. They didn't even call it frequency. And I've heard recordings of spark but I've never heard what it would sound like actually to be operating on the air and I'd love to be able to hear that. I guess we'll never really have that opportunity. The museum has an extensive modern ham radio station as well. It wasn't operational at the time of our visit. It seems to be a manpower issue. And that seems to be a problem with a lot of museum stations. There are some good ones that are still operating, but there are quite a few that have fallen by the wayside. Maybe the most famous is the station at the Smithsonian Institution's Museum of American History, which went off the air a couple of years ago. If you've got an operating museum station in your area, maybe you want to think about supporting it a little bit more. The museum isn't huge, but you can easily spend several hours or more looking through all the exhibits. There's a lot of radar and satellite stuff in addition to the communications equipment. It's well worth your $3 admission. It's in the same building as Northrop Grumman, so I guess you can see where a lot of the support comes from. It's not too far from the Baltimore airport, so if you're going to be in the Baltimore area, you might want to plan on stopping by the National Electronics Museum. Tell them Ham Nation sent you.